Uh, so let's move on to the next presentation, I mean the plenary address. Uh, now we would like to invite Dr. Renault M.J. Adores for plenary address. He is the senior lecturer in philosophy, University of Nairobi, Kenya. Dr. Reginald, it's over to you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a real joy to be with you today. And I'll just take time to share my screen. Yes, and I will begin right away. Thank you for your patience as I got that sorted out. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see the screen well. Ah, lovely. Um, so uh, I'll start right away and uh, I will be done in the 30 minutes allocated. Um, Professor, Dr. Lauren O. O'Connor, um, conference chair, Mr. Isanka Gamaj, conference uh, convener, Ms. Asha Ratnayake, conference uh, secretary, the academic partner, please accept my deep gratitude for the honor of addressing this auspicious gathering of professionals and activists fired by the desire to promote the welfare of persons with disabilities around the world. I speak to you today as a person wearing at least three hats, three hands, a person with total visual disability since the age of one who has a, a 57 year lived experience of disability. Second heart is uh, a member of the disability rights movement in Kenya advocating for the full inclusion of persons with disabilities. And third, a member of the academic fraternity who not only reflects on the rights of persons with disabilities at a theoretical level, but who also witnesses the devastating effects of marginalization of persons with disabilities in the corridors of academia. And so I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share my thoughts. And um, what I did is take the conference theme, uh, which I found to be very interesting. It takes a village accessing disability services across the globe. And on the basis of this theme, I have given myself the title, the crucial role of professionals with disabilities in promoting access to disability services. I am talking about professionals with disabilities, not disability professionals, because uh, disability professionals are people work, who work in the sector of uh, disability, but professionals with disabilities are lawyers, doctors, engineers, computer programmers, and so on, who have disabilities. Some of them, of course, are also disability professionals. And I'd like to thank my compatriot, Dr. June Njama, for connecting me to the World Disability and Rehabilitation Conference, which is really how I have ended up here with you today. I would like to look at a number of aspects of my topic, an overview of conceptualizations of disability, the medical model of conceptualizing disability, the social model of conceptualizing disability, the communitarian model of conceptualizing disability, categories of disability, obstacles to full inclusion of persons with disabilities, disability services, and finally, the crucial role of professionals with disabilities before some concluding remarks. Let us look at an overview of conceptualizations of disability. The theme of this conference 
is not only fascinating, but also timely. It takes a village accessing disability services across the globe. We in the disability movement have been emphasizing the need to move from the charity model of conceptualizing disability to the rights model of understanding it. The discourse on the rights of persons with disabilities has moved from what we call the medical or charity model, which viewed uh, persons with disabilities as objects of charity to the social model, which views them as holders of rights. Others have questioned that uh, the, uh, the dichotomy between the medical and the social model. For example, I propose a communitarian model, which acknowledges both the place of medical intervention and the need to uphold human rights, while also embracing as many players as possible in the promotion of the welfare of persons with disabilities. Let us look at these three models briefly. I will start with a medical model of conceptualizing disability. The medical model sees disability as a sickness to be treated. And it is associated with a charity approach to intervention. This is to say that according to this model, persons with disabilities are recipients of kindness. Upon reflection, it becomes clear that the charity approach places persons with disabilities at the mercy of society. Society can help them at its convenience and according to how sharp its conscience is. There are at least four problems with a charity approach to disability or any other vulnerability causing factor. First, the charity approach glosses over the systemic injustices that cause disability and or contribute to the violation of the rights of persons with disabilities. What Samir Amin correctly observes about the need to reduce or eradicate poverty can be applied to my present point. And Samir Amin, Amin who was a, a social scientist from Egypt wrote, a discourse on poverty and the necessity of reducing its magnitude if not eradicating it, has become fashionable today. It is a discourse of charity in the 19th century style, which does not seek to understand the economic and social mechanisms that generate poverty, although the scientific and technological means to eradicate it are now available. That's a mean, I end the quote. So what we are saying is the systemic injustices People in this conference are people who work hard. But you work hard in an environment of exploitation and oppression. A man eat man, woman eat woman society, where the majority labor, but get very little for their income. And that alone is a cause of disability. The charity model does not go into that. But secondly, as Graham Hancock memorably illustrated in The Lords of Poverty, the power, prestige, and uh, corruption of the international uh, aid business. While by 1994, $60 billion was spent uh, annually in foreign aid, with the stated aim of giving assistance to communities suffering due to natural disasters such as earthquakes, drought, and disease, and for alleviating long-term hunger and poverty, only a small portion of this stupendous sum was ever translated into direct assistance to the target. Okay. Yeah, Hancock shows that bureaucratic uh, inefficiency, misguided policies, large executive salaries, political corruption and the self-perpetuating overheads of the administrative agencies results in very little tangible action towards the stated goal for which the um, taxpayers in the wealthy North gave the finances. Indeed, most of us have witnessed individuals whose financial and social status skyrocketed 
because of jobs in non-governmental organizations <clears throat> involved in the global charity business, as they enjoyed lavish salaries and allowances and joined the Jet Set Club, all in the name of working towards the alleviation of poverty. And this equally applies to the disability movement. So we have a situation where the charity model has become a cash cow for some in the charity business. And that's the second problem. The third is that a charity approach to addressing social concerns such as disabilities more often than not minimalist as clearly illustrated by the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. Actually, disability was not even mentioned in the Millennium Dis Disability Goals. And some of us think it doesn't have a prominent place in the Sustainable Development Goals. But, but for the charity approach exposes the recipient of the charity to manipulation because the donors decide where, when, and how to give, and is therefore able to set so-called donor conditionalities. As the Jewish people say, he who has the wallet has the agenda. I want now to look at a social model of uh, conceptualizing disability. The, uh, on, the, the, on the other hand, the social model views disability as the result of social and physical uh, environments that are not conducive to the circumstances of persons with impairments. This is to say that disability is not the condition of a person, rather, it is the fact that society Pl uh, 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 pl plans its environment without considering the needs of persons with certain limitations. We in the disability movement love to give the example of a storied building with a staircase and no ramp, which is disabling to a person on a wheelchair. A lift without voice prompts is disabling to one with a visual disability. A room with a doorbell that does not include um, light signals is disabling to the deaf. This point, this point implies that disability is relative. No human being has absolute soundness ability. Persons described as having disabilities are those who find themselves in a social environment in which they cannot function to their full potential simply because the environment was not planned with them in mind. Indeed, there are occasions when persons considered to have disabilities are evidently at an advantage over those without disabilities. For example, in a boarding school where the rule is that all lights go off at a certain time, Children with visual disabilities can still study in their blankets as they do not need light to read braille. The social model of conceptualizing disability is associated with the rights approach to intervention. This is to say that according to this model, persons with disabilities are people with the rights. They possess all the rights that all other humans possess but require extra interventions to ensure that they enjoy these rights. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, conceptualizing disability in line with a social model, says that persons with disabilities include those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments which in interaction with various barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. Article one of that convention says what I have just said. Apart from the numerous rights that the convention uh, recognizes, it makes it clear that its over, uh, overarching goal is the removal of physical and social barriers that hinder the full inclusion of persons with disabilities into society. Towards this end, it lays down two principles. Principle one, reasonable accommodation 
which refers to necessary and appropriate modification and, adjust and adjustments, not implying a disproportionate or undue burden where needed in a particular case to ensure to persons with disabilities the enjoyment or exercise on an equal basis with others of all human rights and fundamental freedoms. In the era of COVID, we have all had to have reasonable accommodations like online conferences, but they are very useful to persons with disabilities. The second principle is universal design, the design of products, environments, programs, and services to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation of specialized design. Nevertheless, universal design does not exclude uh, um, assistive um, devices for particular groups of persons with disabilities where these are needed. Let's look at the communitarian approach. While the charity model, um, while the charity model uh, emphasizes uh, medical intervention, and the social model emphasizes rights, the communitarian model views disability as a dynamic phenomenon encompassing both medical and social dimensions, but one that ultimately concerns all sectors and segments of society. This model, I have actually given it that title just yesterday as I thought about it, but maybe the literature has the title, the term. The theme of this conference could be viewed as encapsulating the communitarian model. It takes a village, accessing disability services across the globe. The communitarian model has the potential to harness finances and goodwill from a much wider range of players than both the medical and social models. So what we are now saying is some of us are no longer sure that we can kick out the medical model. We just have to balance it with rights and we have to balance it with the idea of community uh, because there are people who need lifelong medical care because of severe disabilities. And so having looked at those models, the categories of disabilities are things you know more than me, most of you, but uh, I'll list them anyway. Motor, um, sensory, uh, psychosocial, uh, intellectual, and um, physiological, and multiple disabilities. That is uh, the kind of um, uh, information that I am sure we all adequately have. So I gloss over it in the interest of time. And I go to obstacles to full inclusion of persons with disabilities among, and among the obstacles to the full inclusion of uh, persons with disabilities into society are one, poor needs assessment that result in inadequate interventions. Two lower levels of education among persons with disabilities that hinders adequate advocacy by themselves. Three, widespread ignorance in the general public resulting in stereotypes, prejudices, and um, demeaning references, and I might add demeaning retreatment. Fourth, a symbiosis of poverty and disability. Poverty produces disability, disability produces poverty. Fifth, double, double marginalization of girls and women with disabilities, which even includes other girls and women, further marginalizing them. Once in Kenya, we were having a constitutional review process, and a woman was appointed with a disability to be on the review commission. And other women said, one of our seats has been taken. We need another seat for women. So they were implying that a woman with a disability is not a woman. But the sixth obstacle is inaccessible social and physical 
uh, facilities. So let us look at disability services. I would say that for 20 minutes, I've been, for about 18 minutes, I've been laying ground <laughs> for what I really wanted to talk about, which is disability services uh, in relation to professionals with disabilities. It is the last, um, excuse me. Yeah, it is the last obstacle just listed in accessible social and uh, physical fa uh, facilities. That is the focus of this conference. Disability services are measures taken to mitigate the effects of disability and uh, thereby create an environment in which persons with disabilities can actualize their potential on an equal basis with other members of society. Disability services include, but are certainly not limited to the following. One, rehabilitation of people who have recently become disabled or of people with severe disabilities requiring lifelong support. Two, provision of assistive technologies. We are talking about screen readers, we're talking about white canes, we're talking about crutches, we're talking about wheelchairs, assistive technologies. But the term has, of course, come to mean a lot of computing stuff. And um, we talk about prosthetics for the white kids and the wheelchairs and so on. But the line is difficult. The third is training in the use of assistive technologies. I remember when I first got my screen reader, it took me quite a number of years to even understand how to use it before I could finally start my doctoral studies. And so this is a real need. Fourth, universal design of physical, social, and technological environments to ensure that individuals with the widest possible range of disabilities can function in those environments. We are talking about designing websites so that the deaf, the blind, people who uh, don't have the use of their hands and so on can still use that website. That is universal design. And Fifth, where universal design is lacking, reasonable accommodation of persons with disabilities at school, work, recreational facilities, among others. And so I finally come to the heart of what I wanted to uh, present to you as food for thought, the crucial role of professionals with disabilities. I have said some of them are also disability professionals, but many are not. Many are lawyers, engineers, teachers, computer programmers. Uh, many are musicians and all manner of occupations. And they are highly trained in these fields as professionals, not as people with disabilities. I hold the view that disability services are or ought to be ultimately about promoting the full inclusion of persons with disabilities, including such persons taking part in promoting the provision of disability services themselves. It is in this regard that I wish to highlight the crucial role of professionals with disabilities in promoting greater access to disability services. Professionals with disabilities can contribute to this endeavor in several ways. First, being people, okay, before I go to the ways, but being people with lived experiences of disabilities who also have the advantage of professional acumen, they can do the following. One, effectively advocate for allocation of public resources to the provision of disability services. Because you know, cash, money is crucial. And those of you who work in the disability sector, you know how scarce money can be. And professionals with disabilities can join in, in advocating increased allocation of finances. Secondly, 
They can participate in constitutional, legislative, and policy reforms to enhance the provision of disability services. And in Kenya, we have done just that and got ourselves a number of provisions in the constitution that safeguard the rights of persons with disabilities. Third, some of them are trained in fields that are relevant to the provision of disability services and would therefore provide such services with exceptional passion. I know people with disabilities who have masters in disability uh, uh, rights, disability law, special needs education, and they take it up with extra gusto because of their lived experience as persons with disabilities. Fourth, in view of their considerable understanding of social and political processes, they are equipped to mobilize other persons with disabilities to advocate for their rights in the socio-political arena. They can mobilize other people who have disabilities but are not professionals to join public campaigns for greater accessibility. I have personally witnessed several instances in my own country, Kenya, of what the provision of, advocate, uh, of adequate disability services can do. I think of the co-founder of SOPVIT, my co-founder of SOPVIT, the Society of Professionals with Visual Disabilities, James Geshohi, who lost his sight while working as an accountant, but today he is highly competent in information and computer technology, and is our main point of reference on matters of ICT. I think of Dr. K.I. Laibuta, who lost his sight while studying for a bachelor's of commerce at the University of Nairobi. Through adequate rehabilitation, he went back to the university to study law, graduated, studied for a master's in law in the UK, and has held several positions in Kenya, including university teaching positions, member of the prestigious Constitution Implementation Commission, and has recently been appointed judge of the Court of Appeal. In fact, Kenya now has at least three judges with disabilities. For along with the Justice Laibuta, we have Justice Mombi Goge, a person with albinism at the Court of Appeal, and Justice Monica Mbaru, a person with low vision at the Labor Court. I think of Professor Michael Ndurumo, who is deaf since his teen years since he was in high school. He teaches psychology at the University of Nairobi. And I think of myself, Reginald Udur, now senior lecturer in philosophy at the University of Nairobi, the first person with total visual disability to be appointed to a substantive teaching position at a Kenyan public university in 1992, with at least nine others following afterwards. Having the honor of addressing you today, and these are but a very few examples. We have teachers, lecturers, lawyers, and computer programmer, programmers. There is room for greater, um, for greater diversification of professionals with disabilities if only disability services are provided more robustly. And I'd just like to mention that in Kenya, we formed this Society of Professionals with Visual Disabilities, where we do a number of things together. One, we equip other, we equip, sorry, we equip each other with skills that make us more effective in our profession. And in fact, we started by equipping each other with computer skills. Uh, when when um, computers became so widespread about 20 years ago in Kenya, we teach each other at no cost. The bill you get for being taught is that you must teach somebody else. Talk about um, resource management. We also invite people to talk to us about various issues of professional interest. We also uh, 
help in rehabilitating people who have recently lost their sight. We tell them we are around and you are joining a happy community with challenges, yes, but you will make it. And we also join the wider disability community in Kenya, disability movement, to lobby for constitutional, legislative, and uh, policy reforms. And we also have social days where we just come together with our families, play, eat, and laugh. And so I want to come to the end of this. In conclusion, considerable work has already been done towards the provision of disability services. But much more work remains to be done. Most importantly, let us all serve the cause of providing disability services with utmost respect, and I would add confidence for persons with disabilities, because disrespect is often one of the most debilitating challenges that persons with disabilities face. In this regard, the following sayings regularly used by persons with disabilities encapsulate their aspirations for dignified interactions with other members of society. A, we want opportunity, not pity. B, nothing for us without us. And that's why we need professionals with disabilities in the field of uh, disability services. C, we are fully human, so treat us as such. And D, we are fully human, so refer to us as such. I thank you for listening to me.